Hey there chemists, in this lesson we're going to look at how we use what's called nuclear magnetic resonance or NMR spectroscopy to elucidate the structures of molecules. Uh, it has to do with the fact that nuclei have a property called spin and on your notes is just a visualization of what it looks like when they're in random spin states and then how they respond to an applied external magnetic field. Uh, which is what an NMR instrument essentially is. And you'll notice in the picture, the nuclei will align with the field. And we can measure uh, the difference between these spin states. So just to summarize a little bit of that, a nucleus is like a tiny bar magnet. That's how you can think of it, because it has this spin property. And it can align actually with or against an applied external magnetic field, and the nucleus is in a state of what's called resonance. This is not the same phenomenon that we're used to talking about with electronic rearrangement. It's different, same word, but different meaning in this case. Uh, and when it's in resonance, it's irradiated with energy equal to the difference between its spin states. You can flip the spin from one to another, and an NMR instrument delivers and measures the energy difference between those spin states. So that's a very brief review of just how it works. As with most of the analytical techniques we're gonna learn about in this course, our job is to learn how to interpret a spectrum. So that's what we're gonna do in this video. Um, there's a brief paragraph here that I'll let you read on your own that talks about how different hydrogen atoms show up at different locations along the x-axis. These are called chemical shifts. Uh, that's just the name for that difference in spin state. But what's important for us is to notice that different types of hydrogens show up in different spots on this spectrum. I'm drawing another infographic from compound chemistry, uh, really useful, that shows the different types of hydrogens and where they exist all the way to the right. We have very saturated looking alkane hydrogens. Uh, and then in the, in the twos, you get to ones that are next to ketones or allylics. Uh, in the threes, you get to ones that are near halogens and oxygens. Um, and then we get up into alkene hydrogens, getting more and more electron poor until eventually you get to very electron poor hydrogen atoms that are either attached to uh, benzene rings or aldehydes or carboxylic acids. So the only thing I'm gonna annotate on this chart is that you have very electron poor hydrogen atoms onto the left side and fairly electron rich. And this is just meant to serve as a guide of where of hydrogens show up, but it really depends on the molecule that we look at. So we'll look at some examples and see how we can apply this. Um, NMR tells us so much information compared to the two techniques we talked about before this lesson. And you can imagine combining this with things like mass spec and IR and really getting at an actual molecular structure. There are four things we can get from an NMR readout. First of all, the number of signals in the spectrum tells us the number of types of H number of types of hydrogen atoms, how many different chemical environments exist in that molecule. The signal location, the second thing, the signal location tells us what type of environment. And that's what that chart up above shows us. Depending on where it shows up in the spectrum, you can tell what else is near that particular hydrogen in the molecule. Uh, the area or the integration, I'll write that next to this, of the signal is quantitative. And that tells us the number of each type. So I can tell if I have two hydrogens in one environment and three in another. And lastly, something we'll get to a little bit later, but I'll mention it now, what's called the splitting tells us the number of neighboring hydrogens. In other words, who else is nearby in the molecule? And just to clarify right now what a neighbor is, if we look at a specific hydrogen atom, and let's say it's attached to a carbon, it's most commonly what we're going to be looking at, the adjacent carbon 
could have hydrogens on it, and those are considered neighboring hydrogens. They're separated by adjacent carbons. Whereas two hydrogens on the same carbon are not neighbors of each other. They're most likely in the same environment and would show up as one signal. It's also worth mentioning, I'll put this way back up at the top, that this method is useful for any atom with an odd number nucleus. So hydrogen one is the most common nucleus that we're gonna look at. Uh, we'll also learn how this applies to carbon. Uh, it applies to the less abundant isotope, carbon 13, but you can actually change the instrument to make it detect anything with an odd number nucleus. Folks have done phosphorus NMR or fluorine NMR. It's very specific uh, if we want it to be, but largely we look at the hydrogen nucleus. So this is often called proton NMR as a result, since we're looking at the most abundant atom, uh, most abundant isotope. Okay, so at the bottom, we've got just a sample spectrum of a molecule. And in this case, even though it's a line structure, we've drawn out all the different hydrogen atoms, and we're gonna we're gonna write on the spectrum the pieces of information that this tells us. Uh, you'll notice first of all, it's four signals along the axis. Uh, there's three very significant ones off to the right. There's one very difficult one to see off to the left, but that is a signal. This is actually a ChemDraw generated. NMR spectrum, but it's pretty accurate for what this uh, hydroxy ketone would look like. And uh, the location of those signals tells us a little bit about what type. So remember, if we just go down the list, the number of signals, there's four of them. So there's four different types of hydrogen environments, chemical environments, for the atoms uh, in this molecule. The location of those tells us what type of environment they're in. Um, if we sort of cross-reference this with the chart up above, these look like alkyl hydrogens, which makes sense. We have some alkane CH3 groups here. And then in the middle, in the twos, we have things that are next to double bonds. And that would match up with the chart up above. Those must be these three and these two. They're both one away from that carbon oxygen double bond. So they're kind of like allylic hydrogens, but not really because they are one away from a carbon oxygen double bond, but they show up in a similar spot. And then the only hydrogen we haven't accounted for yet is the OH. That must be this broad signal out here. That's the alcohol, which are usually easy to see because they're often quite broad as opposed to being so sharply defined in a spectrum. And you'll notice in the reference chart, uh, alcohols and amino hydrogens, uh, due to H bonding and other reasons, can show up in a very broad range, anywhere from a very low chemical shift to something rather high. It's not too surprising. In fact, this one shows up really high in the sixes, uh, but that must be that six. That takes care of how many and the location. The area isn't given on this spectrum. The instrument would give it to us, and it would list this as a one hydrogen signal all the way to the left, whereas this would be a two hydrogen signal, a three hydrogen signal, and then this one would account for a six hydrogen signal. And that matches up perfectly with our one H, that's the alcohol, two others that are next to the ketone, followed by three more on the other side of the ketone, and lastly, those six. So it's this one to two to three to six ratio that the instrument can actually give us. And even though it looks like it somewhat corresponds to the height, that's not true. It's actually an area underneath a very hard to see curve. If you look very closely, this is actually a curve, a signal with some amount of defined area underneath. And that's what the instrument can indicate. Uh, and integrate for us. It tells us how many hydrogens occupy that signal. The last thing, what's called the splitting, actually isn't very useful in this spectrum. Uh, they're all what are called singlets, meaning they are not split into any further peaks beyond the signal, signal that we see. Uh, and that does tell us that none of these have any neighboring hydrogens. And that's true. If you look at the carbon all the way to the left, or rather the hydrogens attached to it, and then go to the adjacent carbon, oh, there's zero neighbors 
on that carbon. So it would be sp not split at all because there aren't any neighbors. Uh, we'll look at some more complex splitting right now, actually, if you just flip to the back. So uh, when hydrogens do have neighboring hydrogen atoms, we see what's called spin-spin coupling. And each signal is split into multiplets. Now, how much it's split into tells us how many neighbors. If there are zero neighbors, it's not split at all. It's a singlet. One adjacent hydrogen would give you a doublet, two adjacents, a triplet, three, a quartet, etc. So it follows what we call the n plus one rule. The n plus one rule. Where the number of peaks is equal to the number of neighbors plus one. So six neighbors would be split into seven peaks. You get what's called a septet, which means if we look at the splitting pattern, we can interpret how many neighbors it has. So let's look at a splitting pattern for a really simple molecule. In this case, uh, tribromoethane, this molecule here, which only has two types of hydrogen atoms. Uh, there's the single hydrogen attached to the carbon with two bromines, and then there's this CH2 group attached to the carbon with one bromine. And we only have two signals as a result, one for each. We can probably already tell which one is which by both the location and the relative integration. If we did an actual NMR analysis of this, uh, the machine would be able to tell us that the signal to the left would be worth one hydrogen and the signal on the right would be worth two hydrogens. But you'll notice they're not singlets. The one on the left is split into a triplet, which we just abbreviate with a T, and the one on the right is split into a doublet, which we split, which we just abbreviate with a D. A triplet is one more than two, so that means it has two neighbors. And a doublet means we have one neighbor. And if you look back at the structure, that's exactly what we have. So this hydrogen here has two neighbors. So the one hydrogen integration is split into a triplet. That's what I mean by how, how much information we get out of this. We get so much information from an NMR spectrum, how many of the H's there are, how many neighbors there are, even what type of environment they have. You know, the one hydrogen here is very far to the left, so it's very electron poor. That makes sense. It's attached to two bromines. So more electron poor, parentheses, near two Br atoms as opposed to the one right next to it, which is on a carbon, two hydrogens on a carbon, attached to only one bromine. So not quite as electron poor. So knowing that, hit pause and take a look at the next spectrum, this ester. Start by drawing out all the different hydrogen atoms that this molecule has and simply make sense of the spectrum, interpret the spectrum. Why are there the signals that you see? Where are they located? How much should they integrate for? And why does the splitting pattern make sense? Okay, if you've done that, let's just draw out the hydrogens that we have. There's three on the methyl over here. There's two on the carbon right next to the oxygen. And then we have three more all the way on the end. So we have exactly three different types of hydrogens. The methyls, which I'll just highlight. And then we have this methylene. And then we have this different methyl all the way off to the right. So if we had to figure out which spot showed up with which hydrogen, we could do that by any number of reasons. Uh, the free hydrogens off to the left, they have no neighbors on the adjacent carbon. So this should be a three hydrogen signal, but not split at all. It should be a singlet, so a three hydrogen S. The two hydrogen group would be worth two hydrogens. It should integrate for two. It does have neighbors. Those three neighbors would split the signal that's worth two hydrogens into a quartet. You would get a splitting of a quartet. And likewise, these three hydrogens would integrate for three, and they would be split by the adjacent two neighbors into a triplet. So actually the pairing you'll notice of the quartet and the triplet makes sense. If you have a group of hydrogens who have neighbors, 
they'll see their neighbors and the neighbors will also see them. It always goes both ways. I see you, you see me. It's never one or the other. It's always both. So that means I could identify this right now. We'll just match up the highlighting colors here. That three hydrogen triplet must be this signal off to the right. That two hydrogen quartet must be this one all the way to the left. And then the three hydrogen signal, uh, signalet happens to be the one right in the middle. And then even the peak location makes sense. The most electron poor off to the left makes sense because those are hydrogens on a carbon that are directly attached to an oxygen, which should show up in the threes and fours. Whereas the, the intermediate hydrogens, one away from a double bond, those show up in about the twos, and then the methyl group all the way to the right, very electron rich by comparison. It can make sense that the spectrum matches that molecule. I'll just wrap it up and show the very last one where we have this molecule with quite a complicated spectrum. I would not expect at this stage of the course to be able to interpret this, but it shows you how complicated it can get. And the whole reason for this last one is the asymmetric carbon right there. So when you draw in your hydrogens here, it's a little bit more complicated than you might think at first. Because of that asymmetric carbon in this epoxide, it desymmetrizes the molecule, and you actually get five completely different hydrogen atoms, all due to the fact that that asymmetric carbon makes what otherwise might look like identical spots different from each other. They're either sin or anti to respective groups elsewhere in the ring. And we can even highlight a little bit about which one is which. Uh, if we look at the signals, uh, the one right in the middle would be split into a complicated splitting pattern by those four neighbors. So we see what kind of looks like a, a, a pentet right in the middle here. And then the rest have even more complicated splitting because they're split in this case, let's just look at this one all the way to the left, uh, attached to a halogen. That would be split by the one neighbor on the adjacent carbon. It's actually split by the hydrogen attached to the same carbon, the geminal carbon, because it's different. So identical protons split, non-identical protons split each other. Non-identical H's split each other. And most of the time, if you're on the same carbon, you're in the same environment. But with asymmetric carbons, the story can change a little bit. So this particular hydrogen is actually a pair of doublets because the hydrogens attached to it nearby are so different. It's split into a doublet by that neighbor and another doublet by that one. And you actually see the same thing for the other three. You see another pair of doublets for one of them. And then the last two exist as another pair of doublets, what they actually call a doublet of doublets for each one. So that's a little more complicated than most of the examples you'll see. Uh, if you want to get a head start, you can flip to the next page and try to do some exercises. But that's just an introduction to how we use to identify the structures of compounds.